Hey, what's going on, everybody? It is Aaron Trevini here, and we have another wonderful guest. We have Erica Sova from Houston, Texas. How are you doing today, Erica? Hey, great. Thank you so much, Aaron, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, it's it's great to connect with you, and I'm, I'm really glad that we could uh, we could have you on the show. Yes, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I know as we kind of spoken about, I, I like a, a lot of the content that you that you're that you're doing on, on Instagram and, and your social media channels. Um, but the, for those of us who aren't familiar with you, would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I absolutely will. Hello, everybody. My name is Erica Soba, and I'm a marketing strategist. I teach service-based business owners, realtors, CPAs, attorneys, financial advisors, uh, how to actually do the marketing. I'm more of a done with you type of service. I There's so many different names out there for what it is that I do. Marketing coach, consultant, teacher, whatever it is, but we'll sit down together, strategize, and start working through all the different foundational pieces of marketing. I've been doing this for, well, I've been in marketing for almost nine years now, and I went out on my own, ventured out on my own, and started my own consultant business about a year and a half, and a, a year and a half ago, and it's been, I mean, it really took off. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I can tell that, you know, even through your content, I can tell that you're, you're really passionate about, about what you do. Yeah, but marketing is, it's, uh, it's very fun. There's a, there's a lot of pieces to marketing that people don't realize. And I like to explain it like it's a game. It's a game trying to figure out what works, what doesn't, what people like, what people attach to, what they don't, tweaking, changing things, data. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot to be passionate about. Yeah, I, I would imagine. I mean, even like you just said, it's a, it's a game, right? So you're kind of toying with ideas. Hey, does this work? Does that work? And it's it's kind of almost never ending in a way. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, no, and I'm I'm curious about you. I mean, maybe when you were when you were growing up, did you have a knack for marketing, or did you see yourself working in this, or how did you kind of get into the industry? Yeah, so I actually started out wanting to be a teacher, <laughs> um, an elementary teacher. I, that has been my dream since I was in kindergarten. I would play, most girls would play with Barbie dolls and dress up. I would be playing teacher and I would have my little sisters sit down and we would have class. So I went to Texas A&M to get my uh, education degree. As soon as I graduated, I went to be a first grade teacher. I was a first grade teacher for about a few years and I was on a path to become a principal and I started like looking at all my different options, what I had to do in order to become a principal because there's a lot of pieces involved in that. And one of the things that I needed to do was work on my interview skills because when I went to interview to become a first grade teacher, I went on one interview and I got offered the job. So I've never really been on an interview path. And my dad at the time said, you know, I'm really excited that you want to pursue this principal route, but you're going to have to practice interviewing because you're not going to get just one interview and get the job. It doesn't work that way. So I ended up going on um, one interview over the summer and I interviewed for a mortgage company, which had three people. It's a mortgage company here in Houston. And they had three employees at the time, no marketing department. And I had no intention of leaving teaching. It was merely to just practice interviewing and being, you know, in that kind of situation. And I don't know how to explain it, Aaron, but I ended up taking the job. I cannot explain why I did that. It was just everything in the universe was like, Erica, you have to take this job. So I took this job and uh, I got hired on to do biz uh, business development, basically outside sales, where I had to go door knocking, pass out cookies and donuts, that whole thing. And when you go from teaching first graders who tell you that they love you to death and draw pictures of you guys frolicking in the meadow to outside sales where people treat you as if I don't have time for you, it was just so drastic. And I, I, I would cry <laughs> a lot. I was so not ready for that shift. So I told my boss at the time, you know, I, I don't, this isn't for me. Um, thank you so much, but I'm going to go back to teaching. And he was like, well, hang on. You know, we don't have a marketing department. So why don't you take over marketing? Well, I went to school to be a teacher. I didn't, I knew nothing about marketing, Aaron, like literally nothing. I went to Google. I remember like searching in the search, search Google search bar. What is marketing? Because I had no clue. 
And um, as I'm sure when you first started with marketing, as everybody else, when you start to research marketing, there are so many things out there. You don't know what you're supposed to listen to. You don't know what's what. You don't know how it fits in the grand scheme of things. And so I'm the kind of person where I'm like, okay, you want me to do marketing? I will do marketing. So I just kind of took what I was learning and putting it into action. And it wasn't pretty at the beginning, but as I continued to take action, and started doing, I realized what was working and what wasn't. And I just slowly started to figure it out myself. So much so that the company started growing leads year over year. And then the loan volume was closing year over year. Then we had to start hiring people year over year. Then we opened up another location and another location. And all the while people were like, ma'am, <laughs> what is your secret? What did you do? And so I started teaching people, oh, I did this and I did this and I learned, don't do this. Stay away from that and make sure that you do this. And if you do this, make sure that you do it this way and not this way. And so as I started teaching people, I found that that was one of my favorite parts of my job. I ended up growing with the company and became EVP, which was awesome. But I was in charge of HR, IT, office management, and all these things that were fun. And it was really important to know, especially now that I'm a business owner, but my heart and passion was in marketing. And so now that's, you know, full circle. Here I am teaching marketing again. I may not be teaching first graders, but I'm teaching business owners, which is so much fun. Um, nobody's having to like raise their hand and ask to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so there's like, slight differences, but it's, it's fun. Full circle. I'm teaching again. And so I didn't know anything about marketing, but because I took action, I started to learn a, a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, what I, what I like about that story, it's kind of a, a recurring theme of, you know, you just putting one foot in front of the other, you were, you know, you were set on the teaching and then you kind of transition into something else. But at the end of the day, I would imagine you're kind of using your teaching skills in a different capacity. Yes. And it's definitely been beneficial for me as I work with my clients, because I'm, I don't want to just say you need to be doing this. I'm very much a, you need to do it because this happens. And then I also always draw pictures and create visuals because the teacher in me is like, let me just little, have a little story time here with a, a visual analogy. So I've got, I get to use my, my teaching skills to help, which has been very beneficial for my clients. And I know that they do greatly appreciate that side of me. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and you touched on something really important and interesting. Is it kind of a, I, I know maybe when you were a kid, you know, maybe you heard something like, you know, well, why do I have to do this? Well, because I said so, right. Yes. You know, whereas for you, you're kind of, you know, not so much uh, heavy handedly telling someone something, but more of showing them why it's important. Well, and, and I think that that's super important for people to, to fully grasp the importance of what we're doing, if they understand the why. And I partly, part of that comes from my parents. They were very good about explaining the bigger picture. My dad, he's also a, a business owner. And so um, understanding the why is is it motivates you to do the what? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm curious as well, more of the, uh, I guess, more of the psychological shift you had to make, right? I mean, you, you kind of talked about dealing with first graders to, you know, dealing with people who, you know, would say, hey, get out of here. And then, <laughs> you know, kind of transitioning to something else. Uh, I would imagine that was probably a difficult transition. It was, it, it very much was. Uh, first graders, they want to please you. They want to make you happy positive affirmation, positive reinforcement, all of those different redirection. Those are very, those are things that came very easily to me. I'm a words of affirmation person. So when you have all these first graders telling you that you're their favorite teacher and they have so much fun in your classroom, uh, that environment is so positive and it's so fun. And yes, absolutely transitioning into not so much a negative environment, but it's definitely a different vibe. People are there to do business. They're not there to draw pictures. They're not there for words of affirmation. And so I had to really work on my mindset that uh, this transition, this change was a good thing and that it had nothing to do with me. It was just a different, it was just a different environment. And so I had to really, I had to really work on that. And honestly, Aaron, I still have to work on that. Um, I, I, I think that mindset is a continual thing that we have to 
work on and grow and that it's ever changing and ever evolving with each phase and each season in our life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's super important so that you can uh, vibe well so that you, you can put that on others as well. And, you know, you're, you're the creator of your universe. Yeah, no, and you, uh, you, you use an interesting word there was creator, right? So, you know, maybe you're going from teaching where you're kind of, uh, you're instructed to, you know, you have your curriculum, you have your, you know, your, your daily uh, objectives to, to complete. Whereas if you're a business owner, at the end of the day, it's entirely up to you. So I'm curious, you know, how did you kind of make that mindset shift, you know, from teacher to, to business owner? I hired coaches. Yeah. I am such a fan of coaches. I am such a fan of coaches. In fact, when I was learning how to do marketing, anytime there was a, a training or some type of workshop, a boot camp, anything, I would tell my boss, hey, I really would like to attend this. And he would Ab- absolutely, whatever, here you go. Because I, I'm, I've always been a student at heart and I don't, if I can find ways to get the answer quicker, I'm going to do that. So when it came to transitioning from, from being an employee to then being a business owner, I knew that I don't want to waste time figuring it out and learning all the hard lessons, even though there will be hard lessons that I learn and no amount of classroom time is going to get me ready for those, but I can at least have a roadmap, a blueprint, a guide and someone to hold my hand and encourage me along the way that this is kind of where your mind needs to be. This is where you need to be thinking. This is where you need to be strategizing. And then we can work together to build upon that. So the very first thing that I did was hire a business coach. The second thing that I did was hire a sales coach because marketing is my expertise. Sales is its whole other animal. And I'm like, wait, what? (laughs) Word choice is important. Tone is important. The order of questions is important. And until you learn all of those things, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So those are the two things that helped me transition into being a business owner. And I will say it's greatly benefited me, Erin, because a lot of people told me, especially in the online entrepreneur world, I was told that it would take me about one to three years before I started making money and, and, and doing well. And within the first six months, I was, I was already doing pretty well. I'm on my, I mean, I'm on the path right now to beat my EVP salary, which is pretty amazing. Very, very amazing. And I, I greatly attribute that to number one, my marketing skills. And number two, because I hired people, I hired people to help me get there. Yeah, completely. I mean, you know, why reinvent the wheel when you can consult with, you know, an experienced professional like yourself, who's, uh, you know, who's really honing in on, hey, this is how you do marketing or sales or whatever it may be. So, you know, Erica, I know you mentioned the different types of people you work with, different professionals. And I'm curious as well, maybe someone has no experience in marketing, but they're really good at their craft. You know, where can they start in terms of getting started and developing a, a marketing strategy? So I am very big on honing in on target audience. You got to know who you're talking to. You have to know exactly who you're talking to. So like whenever I work with realtors, the very first question that I ask is who do you help? And most of the people that are getting started brand new from scratch, they say, well, anybody who wants to buy and sell a home. And my response is always anybody is it really anybody? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anybody who wants to buy and sell a home. And so I go through this little, okay, so anybody in Nashville, Tennessee? Well, no, 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 not Nashville. Okay, so somebody in El Paso. Well, no, not El Paso. And then we just go through all the way. And then finally, when we get down to it, they're like, well, I really actually want to help the first time home buyers in the Katy, mm-hmm. Texas area. So I'm like, so it's not anybody who wants to buy and sell a home, but until you know who it is that you're trying to talk to, until you know who your target audience is, then you don't know how to talk to them. And people, people are more willing to listen to you and listen to what it is that you have to say if you are calling them by name. 
Otherwise, you're just somebody standing on a soapbox yelling and hope that it falls on the ears that you want it to, but nobody's going to pay attention to you unless you're literally calling people by name. So, and not just that, you've got, you have to be able to speak to people's problems, speak to people's concerns. Another example I always give is if you know that you're helping first time home buyers, then you know what kinds of questions they're asking. You know what's concerning to them. You know what's scary to them. If you're somebody who's helping people purchase million dollar homes, their questions are drastically different than those at purchasing a home for the very first time. Their concerns are drastically different than those that are buying a first time home, you know? And so if you know, okay, I am helping people with million dollar homes or I'm helping people with a first time home buy, then you can start talking to those people and specifically speaking to those questions, concerns, solutions, those myths, those all of those tips, tricks that those specific people need to know. And then when you know who you're talking to and you know exactly what you're saying, people are more willing to listen. And then they're more willing to translate over into that client status, that client mindset. So anybody who's just getting started, that's step one, know who you're talking to. Yeah, absolutely, Erica. You know, and I'm curious as well, you know, you mentioned uh, knowing who you're talking to, but one thing that can get a bit especially in this new uh, tech age, right? It can get overwhelming in terms of the amounts of platforms we use, right? So there's Facebook, there's Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, uh, and you have all these different uh, platforms. You know, if, if someone is not accustomed to, to marketing, where do they even get started? So it goes back to target audience. Number one, where is, who's your target audience? And then where are those people spending their time? I know that it's like, oh, well, here's the TikTok is the latest thing, but is your, are, is your audience there? Are the people that you're trying to get in front of actually on TikTok or are they actually on LinkedIn or are they actually on Facebook? And then some target audiences are spread across several different platforms, but I always encourage pick one, one that you know your target audience is going to be, and then be amazing at it. Be amazing at it. And then once you are starting to get traction and you're starting to get business from it and leads and all of those things, then open up the doors to all the different platforms. So that's not to say that you don't have posting, you're not posting on LinkedIn, you're not posting on whatever, but like if you have to put all your effort into one particular thing, pick, just pick one, pick one and be amazing at it. But it's got to be a platform where your target audience is spending their time. Yeah, absolutely. And you also touched on, on leads, right? So maybe you're, you're getting these leads, maybe they're DMing you on Instagram, you're sending you messages, maybe they respond to a call to action. You know, what's kind of, what, what's really the, the first step in, in contacting and, in, in nurturing a lead? Well, I, part of one of the classes that I teach is, is called putting the marketing pieces together and building your brand. And this is something that I teach to, to realtors. And I always tell them, okay, number one, you need to know who you're talking to. Number two, you need to know where you're going to talk to them. But then number three, you always have to lead them to the next step. It's not just enough to post on social media and you have to get out of this mindset of posting as if you are using it for social reasons. You are a business owner. You are not there to socialize the way that you think you are. There's supposed to be strategy behind your socialization, behind, behind uh, you having that presence. And the strategy should be to be collecting those leads, getting their email address, having them opt in to some type of lead magnet or opt into a newsletter, something that they find value, something that your leads would want to have. And then when you get their email address, then you continue to stay in front of them via email marketing and nurture them. But whatever it is that you decide to do, you need to have a step one, this is going to happen. Step two, I want this to happen. And then use like a, an SOP basic, build out an SOP of what that's going to look like, whether you're reaching out to them, cold reach, whether you're reaching out to the people that have opted in for something, all of that needs to be documented so that... When you start growing and you start scaling and you have somebody else take over the position of posting on social media, they know exactly what they need to do, what they need to say, how they need to say it, when they need to say it, what they need to do next, what they're including or not including, all of those things. They have to be completely documented. So posting always has to have a strategy. 
And the strategy should always be to collect email addresses. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's easy to just, uh, you know, maybe get seduced by all of the content that it's being put out and maybe, you know, maybe there's a picture, but you can have the, the best picture. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about that message and call to action. Yes. Call to actions are key. Key, especially when posting as a business owner, asking them to do something, even if it's something as little as, hey, I found this post valuable, like my post. Anything, anything, but ask them to do something and people are willing to do it. You just have to ask. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm curious as well, you also, uh, you know, use the word brand. So you were kind of talking about brand. Can you kind of describe, um, you know, what, what a brand is and maybe why it's important to, you know, business in 2021? A brand is, is what people think of, what they feel, what they, all the five senses, when they think of you and your company. For service-based business owners specifically, to me, I always tell people, you're selling your brain. That's what, that's what you're selling. You're selling your experience, your knowledge, all the tips and tricks that you have, all of the things that you have had to get out of sticky stitch, all of that stuff is what makes you so good at your, your niche, your service, whatever it is that you provide. And because you're trying to market or promote that you have the experience and the knowledge to accomplish whatever it is that they need, like a realtor, that you have the knowledge, the skills, the expertise to purchase the home or to successfully put their home on the market and get a good rate, right? People have to trust that you know what you're doing. They have to trust all of those things. They have to know that you're going to be responsive. They have to know that you're going to communicate well. They have to know that you're going to have professionalism. They have to know that you're timely. They have to know that you say what you mean and you mean what you say. And so all of those pieces of being a realtor are part of your brand. If they were to hear your name, hey, have you ever heard of Aaron Trevino? Oh yeah, he is X, Y, Z. All of those things that they use to describe you all the way from, well, he's, he's dress is really nice or, you know, he's always got a fun personality. He's always smiling. He always makes me feel welcome as service-based business owners. Like that is part of our brand. Never, ever, ever have I heard anybody say, oh, you're a realtor. Okay. Well, first I need to see what your company colors are first. Um, I really need to take it your logo, take a look at your logo before I decide whether or not I want to be with you. No, 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 no. And people get so stuck on, you know, my color, my logo, that's my brand. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Your, your brain is your brand. Your personality is your brand. Your character is your brand, how you present yourself, how you work with other people, that is your brand. And so as you continue to promote yourself, especially on social media, what you put out there, you're, you are painting the picture of who you are, what you're about and what you represent. That's your brand. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that's definitely, there's definitely a, a lot of truth to that. And you also touched on, um, you know, was the, the colors maybe uh, being secondary in terms of importance, but could you kind of talk a bit more about color schemes, maybe, um, you know, seeing black on white or seeing blue on white would make you feel a certain way versus maybe seeing yellow or pink or green or something? You know, I, that to me is very, very personal preference. I know that colors have a lot to do with the psychology of how different colors make you feel. Red is very, you know, passionate and sexy and very bold. Uh, pink is, you know, very friendly and sweet, right? All these colors mean different things. Uh, the only time that I think that colors matter is depending upon when you're creating graphics you know, to post on social media, as long as it's visually pleasing to the eye, whether it's consistent with your brand or not, you want it to be visually pleasing to the eye and you want it to catch someone's attention. So if you're using neon color, go use your neon color. Your goal is to get people to stop what they're doing and be like, wait, what's that bright thing over there? Or what's that flashy thing over there? Because that's what we naturally do. And then we also tend to see very contrasting colors. So white on black, that's very contrasting or black on white very contrasting. Um, website, that would be a great, another place for you to choose uh, your colors wisely. But even then, as long as it's visually pleasing to the eye um, and that people can understand what you do and what you're about without having to figure it out. People don't want to figure it out. They want to know, 
instantly what it is that you do and how you help people. And as long as you can make that clear and it's visually pleasing, yeah, to me, it doesn't really, eh, it doesn't really matter what colors are, are, are selected. And I've played with that on my own social media. I, I wanted to start with like, because my brand colors are bluish just because I like the color blue and it represents certain things, but I have all kinds of stuff on my social media and I'm 90% of my business comes from my social media. So. Yeah, no, no, completely Erica. And um, you know, it's funny you said, because you were, I think on one of your previous posts from last week, you were talking about that where, you know, Hey, you don't want to make your, your potential customer guess, right. You, you don't want them to have to fill in the gaps. You want to make the road easy for them. Yes, we do. And And, you know, it's interesting is that when I talk to clients, a lot of them say, well, you know, I, I want to post about this topic, but I posted about it last month. And so I don't want to repeat. And I'm like, okay, that is assuming that everyone is literally stalking your stuff and watching every single thing that you post and is writing down, oh, no, 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 you did this on, on February 2nd of 2020, so I can't believe you're posting that again. Nobody does that. And we are so, we think that people are obsessed with us <laughs> and that they're watching our every move. And yet the, the truth is that they're not, they're not. We think, I mean, how many people do you closely follow, Aaron, where you're like, ah, 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 you posted this two weeks ago. Do you do that? No, you don't. <laughs> and the likelihood of you actually have seen that post because of the way that algorithms work and what our brain filters and what it doesn't like, even if you did see it, how do I know that you're going to remember it? We just, it's, it's interesting. And I know that I'm at fault for this too. I tend to convince myself that everyone who's following me is going to remember that I posted this two Wednesdays ago at 2 PM. And that's just, that's not how it goes. And so a lot of people are like, oh, well they can, you know, kind of gather what I do from all my posts. I'm like, who's going to gather who, who do you gather? Unless you're going on a date with this person, (laughs) you're not gathering anything. (laughs) No, it's it's so funny. It's funny you mentioned that kind of about the repetition as well. Was it? I follow someone on, on Instagram, and you know, she'll offer you know pretty nice uh, business commentary in the mornings. You know, maybe she's making her coffee, or and her thing also is that she she loves this blueberry muffin protein powder, right? And she'll mention that multiple times a week. But I would imagine her audience doesn't care because the value she's bringing is there. So she just so happens to, to like the blueberry protein powder, right? How funny. And yet people will remember that about her. I remember it, right? <laughs> How funny. Oh, I wonder what people are like, oh, that Erica, she sure loves, I don't, I don't even know what people would say. <laughs> you'll, have, you'll have to follow along and tell me later, Aaron. <laughs> That, that's right. That'll, that'll, uh, we'll, we'll reconvene at the, at the next podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, well, Erica, is there anything that you haven't said that you'd really just like to hit home for us? Oh gosh. Uh, you know, another thing that I love to, to remind people of is specifically when it comes to marketing is you have to track what you're doing. You Absolutely. If you don't have a spreadsheet showing you patterns and trends in your marketing efforts, then unfortunately you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time because you don't know what's resonating, what's working, what's creating engagement, what's not. And if you don't have that data and if you don't have those patterns and trends, then you don't know where you should be spending your time, your effort, your money. If you can't track if it's working or not, like I said, at the very beginning, Marketing is like a game. It's like a game. And the tracking, the data is like your points, right? Whenever you play well, Mario Kart, right? And you're trying to like gather all the gold coins or something. See the, I, I don't know. I, I'm not a, a game person. I, I remember somebody playing a long time ago, but I remember you had to like get the bigger score and whoever has a bigger score wins. That is so marketing. You, you, you have to be tracking things. Is it on an upward trend? Is it plateauing? Is it on a downward trend? And if that's the case, keep doing it, change it up or stop doing it. If you're paying for something and you're not seeing anything from it on a month to month basis, and you have exact data to prove that, then, then you're wasting more money. And so it's just, 
It's super, super important to track your stuff. There needs to be some type of spreadsheet that accompanies your marketing efforts. And so many people tend to overlook that part. It's kind of like accounting. You can't run a successful business and say, oh yeah, you know, accounting, I, I sometimes do it, you know, I, maybe I have a spreadsheet somewhere, but I'm not sure. You make money, you spend money and you make some more. Uh, no, mm -mm, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I'm not sure you can find success by, by keeping track of accounting that way. And just like marketing, I, I don't find, um, I, I'm not sure that there would be a company that could be successful without it, so. Yeah, well, definitely well said there, uh, you know, and, you know, kind of how you said getting those metrics, those measurables. And I mean, hey, if you're spending your, you know, your most valuable asset, your your time and your money, then you may as well have some metrics to say, you know, is this worth my time or not, right? Is it worth my time? Is it worth my money or not? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, completely, Erica. Well, you know, maybe someone is, you know, in the Houston area, maybe they're somewhere here in Texas or elsewhere in the country and they're uh, looking to, to uh, collaborate with you, um, you know, maybe they want to ask you some questions about marketing or social media, you know, where can we find you? Yes. So uh, there's several places I do. I'm all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, my website is ericasoba.com, E-R-I-C-A-S-O-B-B-A.com. And you can look at all different kinds of things that I offer, all the different curriculums, and uh, the, uh, I've got an upcoming content creation boot camp coming up where I teach people how to post valuable, educational, relatable information because that's what people want to see. Uh, my email address is erica at ericasopa.com and my phone number is 832-339-7050. We can have a no commitment, very easygoing conversation about what your current marketing strategies are. Take a look at what we can be doing differently, what you can, what you're doing really well at, what we can take away from, different things that are missing or, you know, all those different things and just kind of an overview of your current marketing and then make a plan to go from there. Yeah, absolutely, Erica. Well, you know, uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great conversation and we talked a bit uh, about your background, maybe transitioning from teaching uh, into your journey to, to where you are now, different marketing tactics. And uh, it's, it's been real eye-opening and uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Aaron, I really appreciate you inviting me. This has been fun. Sure thing. Well, we'll talk to you later. Sounds good. Bye-bye.